Today, we're going to talk about fertility. Now, over the years, I've gotten a lot of women pregnant. Now, of course, I mean clinically as a holistic doctor. And what I've noticed is that there are some very common areas to look at for fertility cases that conventional care completely misses. Conventional care will jump into elaborate and expensive procedures right away without even looking at the basics. And our job in holistic care is to really go back to the basics of physiology, right? And getting back to normal physiology, we, we have improved function. And the body was designed to get pregnant, at least the female one. So we're going to talk about five pillars. These are five areas that every fertility patient needs to look at. And of course, each fertility case has additional features that might be unique to them. If somebody has a thyroid issue, in addition to the five pillars I'm going to discuss, or gut issues, or autoimmune issues, or anything else, of course, there can be complications. But these five pillars need to be looked at, assessed, and addressed for fertility purposes. And we have a great uh, outcome experience. Now, nobody bats 100%, but we really have done excellent in this category of patient care. Okay, so this also has to be uh, the focus of this video is on the female. For men, there are some challenges that can show up, but they are the smaller part of the picture, the less complicated part of the picture. And with a male patient, we want to do a semen analysis to make sure that everything looks right from them. If they're good to go, then that's their part. That's their contribution. And we deal with the mom to be. And so pillar number one. I released a video recently called Organo Organotherapy, Organotherapy, and this was on the use of glandular and organ extracts to repair and improve function in the body. I think that's worth going back and watching if you're watching this, uh, because I go a little bit deeper on how we heal deeply and build reserves up in the body based on taking in food and storing it in our tissues and storing it specifically in the glands and organs for which those nutrient bundles are used. Now, if somebody's running empty and they haven't been able to metabolize, break down and create those bundles, they're going to be running on empty. And even if they're eating good, they may be running with a smaller amount than is required to build a new human. You can't build a new human just from eating more broccoli or eating good. You have to use your reserves. And if those reserves are depleted, you're going to have infertility or you're going to have a miscarriage or you're going to build a kid with a developmental disorder. There's going to be a deficit. All of these are things we don't want. Or in the last video with the organotherapy, I talk about a female or women who come into our practice who have postpartum deficiencies, which are really powerfully addressed with glandular supplements. And we can see that th the fact that they're so successful shows us that there's a part of nutrition that needs to be understood and studied deeper when it comes to the use of glandulars. So nonetheless, pillar number one is making sure that the mother is fully nutrient fulfilled and not running on empty in any area. And that might be something that we can see with signs and symptoms, or we might just use a base glandular product kind of as a prenatal, which isn't like any other prenatal. It's just in that phase of, hey, we don't want, it's inexpensive and we want to rule it out. We don't want to run with the possibility of a deficiency being the cause here. Okay, pillar number two. Pillar number two is going to be all about blood flow. Blood flow and the uterus and the liver, right? So the uterine lining has to be healthy. And every cycle, there's a chance of the uterine lining shedding and making that uterus perfect and amazing and ready for conception. However, if it's not fully shedding, which is going to involve a period with darker and clumpier blood or a crampier period, right? The cramp is because there's blood stasis. Blood stasis might be systemic, 
uh, involving other features, signs and symptoms, maybe even cold hands, feet, numbness, tingling in the limbs, uh, purpling of the lips like we've discovered in the COVID cases. Uh, but nonetheless, a fertility patient might have systemic circulatory problems or localized circulatory problems to the uterus where the lining is not shedding very well. So in every single case, we're wanting to work with blood flow in the uterus to make sure that that cycle is perfectly successful. So this is uterine lining. This is related to blood flow uh, systemically. And then also the liver. Prior to the cycle starting, the body amps up into a massive detox event. Actually, the cycle itself is a detoxification event. Actually, your body's going to do a clean house so that you can build that new human successfully. And all those contaminants are going to be concentrated down into the uterus so that when you get the message from the hormone system, which we're going to talk about next, then you're going to shed the uterine lining plus all the contaminants. And that means that the liver is on duty that week prior to the menstrual cycle. It's doing all the great burden of filtering and helping with the detox phase. So the symptoms of PMS breast tenderness or moodiness or headaches or acne, those aren't really the hormonal symptoms. Those, those are more of a failed detox pathway from the liver. So that also will impair blood flow to the uterus and cause a darker, clumpier blood, uh, an inadequate shedding of the uterine lining and cramps in the uterus during the period. So that needs to be addressed and it's easy to do it. We do it all the time. Pillar number three, as I mentioned, the hormone system. The hormone system is basically a series of messenger molecules telling other parts of the body what to do and when to do it. So the body is going to orchestrate when it's time to ovulate, when it's time to shed the uterine lining, etc. So balancing that hormone system is going to require some understanding. Unfortunately, when we go to conventional care, they're only looking at numbers and labs. But many of the biomarkers that I use to understand where a patient is or what's needing to be treated in the physiology is based on signs and symptoms. These may not show up in a lab. For example, let's say that I have a female who's 25 years old and she's been trying to conceive with her husband for a year without success. And we see the symptoms of no sex drive and an irregular period and a period that is extremely crampy with dark clumpy blood, with PMS headaches that are severe and acne. And maybe even there's ovulation cramps and hair on the chin, which is going to be another one of the pillars we're going to talk about in a minute. These are all biomarkers that are not necessarily going to show up on a lab, but they're all highly relevant to fertility. And so as I'm treating those systems that those symptoms are related to, that's how I know where I'm at within a case. I don't need to order the labs because I have a vast amount of clinical experience over the many years that I've been in practice. Now, that's also an example with a young female, 25 years old. If I have somebody who's 45 years old who wants to conceive, who's been having unprotected sex with her man for seven years and suddenly they decide they want to conceive, we're late in the game. We're already in an increased risk of complications just because of the age. I want to support them where they're at. But in that case, I probably will run a full cycling female hormone panel, which is a saliva panel where the female patient is going to spit in a vial every day for the entire 30 days so that we can see exactly what hormones are going on and where. I can tell even if they're ovulating from that test result. I don't need to do tests like that most of the time. I'm just telling you with that type of patient, I don't have much time. I don't have any time. We need to know what's going on. With the 25-year-old, I'm watching the signs and symptoms improving, and then we're going to see a pregnancy show up. Um, and most of the patients have been to their gynecologist. They've ruled out other complications. There's really, uh, from the conventional care stand. Uh, care standpoint, mostly they're just saying, let's go into a lot of the fertility drugs and in vitro, all kinds of, um, you know, very costly procedures without trying to make the mother more fertile, without trying to satisfy the first pillar or the second pillar. It's just some of the glaring, obvious areas that we need to work on are completely missed. But nonetheless, um, I do order labs if I'm stumped. I don't order labs if I know what I'm working with. 
And that's one of the things that we see in conventional care. They always order labs. There's no such thing as clinical experience because they're using drugs that are dangerous. So they have to justify them and to manage the liability. But I'm not using things that are dangerous. I can only get more right with the goal being the pregnancy and a healthy caring, a healthy labor delivery, et cetera. So now we get to the fourth pillar and that's going to be dysglycemia. Dysglycemia is any abnormality in the blood glucose lipid stability. This is fluctuating energy levels, cravings for carbohydrates, tired after you're eating, eating knowing you're full but still craving something even though you are full, uh, getting hangry or irritable if you skip a meal, waking up at night to urinate, weight gain. All of these are metabolic disruptions that are coming from vascular inflammation. Vascular inflammation starts with those carbohydrates irritating the blood vessels. Now, there are many people who can handle high amounts of carbohydrates without an issue. The question is, if somebody's become sensitive to that, are they having an over overreaction that's getting in the way of pregnancy? And that can absolutely be the case. So blood sugars that are staying in the blood vessel too long start to cause inflamed blood vessel. The body responds by pushing insulin. And now we have a hyperinsulinemic patient with a spike and drop with their blood sugar levels. And that can absolutely get in the way of pregnancy. That can cause thy thyroid disruption, which can also get in the way of pregnancy. Um, insulin is a hormone. This dilemma of dysglycemia which we often suggest the reset food plan on our website to address. This is affecting the entire hormone system eventually. The adrenal glands are constantly having to pick up the crashes um, and we see that the metabolic um, ditch starts to affect the entire body at some point. This also leads us to our fifth pillar. And this fifth pillar is the number one cause of female infertility, and that is ovarian cysts. Now, women can have ovarian cysts and still not be diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome. However, if there's cysts developing, that's going to get in the way of fertility, and it's the number one cause of female infertility. So what you, if you have cramping when you ovulate, so cramping when you have your menstrual cycle is going to be central, and it's going to possibly go to the low back. But if you have cramping mid-cycle, you have your period, you have your period somewhere in the middle, you're dropping an egg, and there's cramping like a pinch, and it's off to one side or the other, other because that's where the ovaries are. Well, that is likely a cyst or a pre-cyst. Now, doctors won't treat it. They'll call it middle schmerz. It's just a symptom. However, it's not. Like so many things, they're waiting for it to get worse before they address it. In fact, what's happening is the spike in hormones are irritating a problem that's already there. So it's a cyst or it's a cyst in the works. And or they're a female might have had cysts in her history. But the question is, why are they getting the cysts? Now, there are two driving factors for these cysts. One of the factors is that they're unable to regulate their detoxification processes in the body. Our primary systems involve the liver, the gut, and the kidneys, right? Let's say you drink too much alcohol and uh, your body, your liver has to dismantle it, neutralize it, and then you're going to pee it out through the kidneys. But let's say you go to a friend's house and they drank too much the night before. You walk into their room and you smell it in the air. Secondary pathways are the skin and the lungs, right? Skin and lungs. They're breathing out the alcohol, which is a toxic waste, and they're maybe they're sweating it out because they were unable to get rid of it through the liver and the kidneys. Now, if they still have issues like the tertiary pathway or third pathway, you're going to start seeing cystic development, cystic acne, cystic breasts, cystic ovaries. So a cyst is really has a component of a defense mechanism, kind of like a piece of sand that's in an oyster. The pearl is actually a defense mechanism. It's just going to seal it up and protect the body. So some version of that is happening with an ovarian cyst or recurrent cystic development. Then there's a gas pedal, and this is very important. The gas pedal, there's two main ones, but it's going to be an anabolic gas pedal. Anabolic means growth. Think of like the bodybuilders, they take anabolic steroids. So in this case, it's not a steroid, but there's primarily the testosterone that can be cycling a little bit higher than normal in a female, 
or there's insulin. The insulin person is the fourth pillar we just talked about. Their blood vessels are inflamed. They're now overreacting to carbohydrates. Even if they're not eating too many carbohydrates, they're still overreacting to the amounts they are eating, driving up insulin. Insulin is anabolic. Insulin is going to create the body type that looks chubbier. Well, once insulin's pushing that sugar into the fat, the other option is it could be peeing it out. So they're either getting chubby or peeing at night and getting urinary tract infections. That's from the insulin managing the sugar that's causing blood vessel inflammation, right? This person doesn't particularly have an interesting sex drive. It's normal, normal to low. They fluctuate with energy levels and they have all of those craving symptoms that I covered in pillar four. The other one is going to be the testosterone female. And this female typically is going to be more muscular, maybe fit. Maybe her friends are jealous. She's fit without even trying. She's just kind of buff and doesn't gain weight that easy and typically has a higher than normal sex drive and may have hair on the chin. Insulin can cause hair on the chin, but it, uh, definitely testosterone. Testosterone might even cause a few hairs to show up on the chest. In fact, testosterone is really a benefit for women. These women who have a little bit higher testosterone, and of course you can have a little bit of both, high insulin and high testosterone, but the women who have high testosterone, they're athletic. It's not a bad problem to have. However, the testosterone needs to be broken down. These are all liver cases, which pairs up with working on the liver anyways from our prior pillars. But the liver is in charge of dismantling any excess hormones at night. It's going to neutralize them so that you can excrete them out through the urine. And if that liver is behind in its function, then we're going to see a negative effect from those anabolic hormones. Now, and you might see the acne and you might see other things depending on the amount of testosterone. Now, if you're going to conventional care, they're going to wait till there's really obvious acne, cystic acne or ovarian cysts from the testosterone person. They're probably going to give spironolactone. They're going to try to uh, force the kidneys to get rid of it. But really, you don't want to just force the body. We want to repair normal function, especially considering that we're trying to get ready to build a healthy baby. Then on the insulin side, they give women all the time, probably more often than the testosterones, we see the insulin category. They're giving them metformin, which is a diabetic drug. They're treating them for diabetes, yet they're not calling it diabetes. But sure enough, these women are in a pre-diabetic category just based on the effect of the physiology, but they can't call it that because the numbers don't show it, which is ridiculous because diabetes, diabetes is a spectrum disorder. So nonetheless, we control the diet, we get the insulin to calm down and we get lots of babies made. So I hope that you enjoyed this video and I hope that you have uh, some gain some awareness of these complications because when you go to the doctor i'm sure some of you are in this category of fertility struggle none of this is being talked about but there are ways to treat all of this and even as we're getting into the details of our fertility patients there's times when we're even switching the gas pedal even throughout the month like now we're going to give you plant medicine formulas that are increasing circulation that would not be good if you conceived, right? That could cause a miscarriage, right? So we're going to help circulate it, uh, the blood and create that uterine lining. And then when you're going into ovulation, it's like, stop all of that because now we're supporting the hormone system so that as you conceive, you're retaining. Anyways, contact us if you need more information and we will be happy to help. Take care.